Greetings, everyone. Thank you for braving the rain, although I think it's quite beautiful out right now. Thank you for being here today uh, to, to join John Eikenberry and myself in, a, I think, a, a very important discussion about uh, what, what is happening to the uh, larger um, geopolitical architecture and, and the, the, the sets of deals and, and what, what John would call broadly the large liberal order. Uh, what is happening uh, in this era in which some people, including myself, look at this time uh, as one of American decline. And John uh, says, well, whether America is declining or not, what it built uh, is resilient uh, and, and really is laying a path to what the future is going to look like. And I think we're going to have a very, very interesting discussion. John Eikenberry, of course, is Albert G. Milbank Professor of Politics and International Affairs at Princeton University and, in the, and uh, also with the Woodrow Wilson School of Public International Affairs. Uh, John is also author of After Victory, Institution, Strategic Restraint, and Rebuilding uh, of Order After Major Wars. Uh, this is a, a, was a prize-winning book and one of the major books in international relations theory. Um, the fun stuff about John Eikenberry is, and I've always, you know, joked with him because I, I really look at him uh, as my type of D.C. policy wonk. Uh, if New America Foundation had been around 10 years earlier, I'm sure he would have been here leading it uh, and involved. Um, I always joke with him that there are only two jobs, uh, uh, there are two jobs that I would have, you know, loved to have had, but I, I sort of look at him as a future uh, head of a think tank like Carnegie, taking Carnegie into its next era, although Jessica Matthews will probably be very upset with what I just said. Um, and also policy planning at the State Department, um, where I think John is one of the great uh, Kennan style thinkers about uh, what is uh, happening in the world and how we should think about it in a, in a disciplined and um, rigorous way. We just uh, spent a little bit of time together at the American Political Science Association. I joked on my blog that it's one of the few reasons I go to APSA anymore. Um, not, not to knock APSA too much, but it, it has, you know, the great, the American Political Science Association is one of the greatest collection of, of political minds in the world and produces very little with that except John's dinner, uh, which I really admire and, and enjoy. So uh, with that, I want to say hello uh, as well, not only to the folks here at the New America Foundation, but many of the people watching online, uh, either at the Washington Note or at the New America Foundation website. Without further ado, please welcome G. John Eikenberry, who is going to talk about his new book, The Liberal Leviathan. John. Great to be here. Thanks, Steve, for that generous uh, introduction. And uh, uh, I appreciate both what you said and what you didn't say. So <laughs> uh, being old friends, there's so much we could say. Uh, well, it is great to be here and to talk about my new book. Uh, um, this is a book that I'll just put up there so you can enjoy the cover. Uh, it's actually a, a cover uh, written or painted in the 1920s by an American impressionist, uh, Child Hazem. And the sister painting to this one is in the White House Oval Office now, next to uh, uh, President Obama. This one is the is in the Princeton collection, and it's a picture of a flag uh, flags on uh, Fifth Avenue uh, in New York, and it's supposed to convey a sense of of uh, pensiveness, shall we say, about uh, about the American project and America in the the 20th and 21st century. It would also be nice if President Obama went into the bookstore and he saw that and he said, that looks like a painting on my wall, and, uh, and then he'd give it a second look. This book, uh, uh, not likely, this book is uh, an attempt to talk about American power in the 20th century and in the, the new century. Uh, and in that sense, it's, it's interested in, in trying to capture in a portrait, a theoretical, historical, and policy-relevant portrait the great arc of American power and purpose, the way in which the United States rose up in the 20th century and built international order. And in that sense, it's interested in both sides of this great historical drama. On the opening side, the way in which the United States built order, particularly after World War II, although it was a, a larger enterprise during the, the entire century. What kind of order did the U.S. create, uh, uh, particularly after World War II? The U.S. has had more opportunities to shape the international system than any other country in world history. And that's extraordinary. The U.S. has really had an opportunity to imprint itself on the world. How has it done that? Uh, after World War I, after World War II, after the Cold War, and today even in the 21st century, no other country really has all the assets and opportunities to, to shape the international system. And so the question is, how has it done that? Uh, how has it harnessed power to purpose? What has been its vision? 
uh, how has American-led order differed from past orders? And then I, I have a very positive view. I, I, the book is very much, uh, at this level, trying to talk about the American accomplishment. What has America done? And I, I know that we're going to be talking today mostly about what happens after America, that is to say, during the period of decline in American power, but I think it's important to have the baseline of what America accomplished. And as I will argue today, there's much of it that will survive and inform how we think about the 21st century. Uh, but I do ask as well in this book about the other side of the drama, the decline side. Uh, U.S. power is shrinking relative to the rest of the world. Uh, everybody knows that. No one really disagrees with that. It's in the, in the figures, and the rise of China is very important in that. And the question I'm really asking in the book, in this part, is really, as the world becomes less American, will it also become less liberal? Uh, power is shifting. What will happen to the international liberal order? Liberal international order, as I define it, is open order and rule-based order, at least loosely. Uh, and here again, I am optimistic. I'm arguing that the underlying logic of the order that the U.S. created after World War II, the open uh, rule-based characteristics of it, continue to have uh, constituencies around the world, old and new, north and south, east and west, that will continue to find it a, a, an important uh, uh, platform, if you will, for, uh, for uh, engineering 21st century world politics. More on that in a moment. So my book is really an exercise in multitasking. At the one level, it's a book about how to theorize and develop ideas at the level of conceptual frameworks about how the international system works. It's an idea at that level about types of international order. If the American uh, power built a particular kind of order in the 20th century, how do we distinguish between types of orders? So I get into type, typologies of imperial and, and, uh, and liberal types of order. Um, and I also grapple with the uh, argument that I make in this book and try to theorize the argument of why powerful states might actually embrace the idea of rule-based order. Why are rules not simply tools of the weak seeking to stabilize their fragile world, but also tools of the powerful who seek to build environments uh, to pursue their own strategic interests? And I, I make an argument about why restraint and commitment by a powerful state like the United States has a rationality to it, particularly in the setting that the United States is confronted in the 20th and now the 21st century. Um, in that level of theory, I was always, uh, if you will, uh, sympathetic to the Obama administration uh, in the last few years. Uh, um, before Obama was president, there was an interesting interview uh, with him that uh, Roger Cohen of the New York Times uh, conducted, and, and Obama said something as a candidate. He said, I think that in the years ahead, the United States still needs to be the preeminent state in the system, but it needs to show that part of being powerful is to, sh is to exercise restraint. And I looked at that and said, that's my argument. I've been trying to fiddle, fiddle with that argument for 20 years. And uh, so other people e emailed me and said, there's, there's, I think he's singing your song. And there is an argument there about, about why po powerful states have an interest and why part of making power legitimate and durable and acceptable uh, and plenary uh, uh, lead states under certain circumstances to pursue rule-based uh, international order. So the theory is in this book, and it m may not be for all of you, but it's there. Secondly, the book is a, a grand narrative. There is a, a battle of narratives afoot. There are lots of different people and different ideological and geographical places in the world today who are uh, conducting sort of grand narratives of, of where we are, where the U.S. is, where the global system is. And here again, I'm trying to suggest that the U.S. has had this, this quite remarkable um, career on the global stage, uh, transforming world politics and introducing innovations that, that we can talk about. Thirdly, I'm trying to advise uh, foreign policy officials. I'm trying to speak to the grand strategy debate. Uh, 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 and here, uh, I'm, effect, uh, I'm a, in effect a, a, a champion of, of internationalism in a, in a period where nationalism and inward-looking policies and the dysfunctions of democracies and the ambitions of non-democracies are all swirling around us, making the idea of internationalism, a one-world system where we're all working together in cooperative 
uh, collective action uh, more difficult. So I am, I am firmly and as hard as I can thrusting that flag of, of internationalism, yes, liberal internationalism in the, in the, in the ground, and I'm defending it. Um, I'm acknowledging that in a new era, internationalism is going to have to be cheap and on the sly. It's going to be harder to pursue, even in the United States. Uh, but I am trying to suggest that it's functional and it is the kind of grand strategy uh, that, uh, uh, that still fits the American strategic interests and certainly the global problems that uh, are in front of us worldwide. So let me say a little bit about these different features or levels of the book. Um, speaking first really about the past, about the American accomplishment. And here I, in my own words, try to frame the, the past 60 years and what the United States has done. And, and I tell the story, really, of the rise of the United States, the, the unusual way in which the United States built international order. No other state had engaged in this kind of uh, strategic uh, order building, uh, building institutions, global and regional, security institutions, economic institutions, uh, political institutions, the IMF, the World Bank, the United Nations, NATO, the alliances in Asia. Between 1944 and 1951, the U.S. engaged in more, you might say, hyperactive institution building than any other uh, country in history. And you have this uh, accumulation, this complex of institutions, most of which are still around today and continue to provide a kind of platform for uh, world politics and cooperation. The ideas behind the United States uh, uh, order building have also been very much liberal in the sense that they have tried to build on the state system, the Westphalian system, and they are ideas that are now familiar to us all. Free trade, multilateralism, cooperative security, alliances, demogra democratic uh, solidarity, progressive ideals, uh, and U.S. hegemonic leadership. And I try to tell the story in this book about how the United States, in some sense, stumbled into a particular kind of international order, not just a liberal international order, which in some sense it was pursuing and dated back. Its heirs were, were of course, it, it was heir to Woodrow Wilson and to the British 19th century efforts, but a hegemonic liberal order. Liberal hegemony is a term that I'm trying to, to uh, use in this book to describe the American system, uh, where the U.S., in effect, took a more direct role in running the system through alliances, through the dollar, through its own market, through its hegemonic uh, management of the system, it became America Incorporated. It became a liberal system tied and fused, really, to the American system. Uh, and this system, as I go on to argue in this book, was a great accomplishment. It's done a lot of work. And one can list the different accomplishments, opening up the world economy after World War II, reintegrating Germany and Japan. No other uh, world power has flipped its former enemies so quickly and so thoroughly around from being enemies to being friends, Germany and Japan becoming the second and third largest engines of the world economy for decades. Um, Germany and France found a way to live together without war uh, through binding themselves together. Developing countries were brought into the system. Democratic transitions have occurred in Korea and and uh, Taiwan and on down into Southeast Asia. So it's, it's, a, it's an order that has accomplished a great deal. Um, the hegemonic character of this order, of course, is what in many ways is under stress today. And part of my argument is really that, yes, uh, American power is declining in relative terms, and the hegemonic component of liberal order is, is under pressure. There is a struggle for the reallocation of of authority, of rights and privileges, but that in many ways it's not uh, a struggle over the basic or the deeper principles of liberal order itself. And I'll say more about that in a minute. After I sort of talk about the past, I then try to say something about the future. And here I'm in really engaging the debate about the future of, of liberal international order. Everyone agrees power is shifting. National Intelligence Council has written that the master trend of our age is really a, a trend towards multipolarity, a return to multipolarity. And the key question really is, as the world becomes a world with more great powers, uh, as non-Western developing countries rise up, uh, states uh, will be in position to influence that order, and will they buy into and integrate into that liberal order, or will they have their own ideas as well? And here I simply make the argument that uh, 
that U.S. hegemonic control is evolving, but that this wider and deeper liberal order is still very much alive and well. There are growing constituencies in China and in India and Brazil for open-based order. It's why they have become so powerful in the first place, and constituencies are growing. The order itself, as I suggested, is easy to join and hard to overturn. That is to say, it's an, a highly integrative order where countries can, can join in and rise up. China itself is already in the Security Council, and of course, as it becomes wealthy, it can be a, a greater player in the IMF and World Bank. China, moreover, and other rising states don't have really powerful new ideas about international order. They are interested in various ways in mercantilism and other kinds of economic policies, but in the larger sense, they are very much inside the order working rather than outside trying to shift uh, the order in a new direction. And then finally, I argue that when we look into the 21st century, we see a kind of rising period of economic and security interdependence. And this is a phenomenon that is making it more and more necessary, really, for uh, countries around the world to cooperate. So I'm really making the argument that as the, we enter into the 21st century, we are going to be increasingly looking for collective action. Uh, and even rising states recognize this. And so we will be increasingly looking for uh, ways to build on and expand liberal order rather than to, to move in a more a closed a sphere of influence or mercantilist kind of system. So with that, I think I'll end and, and we'll uh, uh, talk about uh, the book and the themes. Okay, well, thank you, John. And I'm going to uh, give you this. Okay. And John is going to sit. I'm going to uh, pose some questions uh, and then involve the audience. I guess, you know, when I think about your argument, um, naturally, you're drawn, one is drawn immediately to the China question. And if you look at China's evolution and you see that China's sort of taken a strategy where, in my view, it has one foot in the system and I think it has one foot out. I think China, uh, a significant portion of uh, Chinese leadership uh, doubts and questions um, the liberal international order that you, you think will endure. Um, and I think they spend some time pondering <clears throat> whether or not the deal they're getting is a safe one for them and for their future. And whether they do, whether they are thinking about something uh, that would be much more uh, of Beijing character, anchored in Beijing, and and a competitor at some some sort. Um, I know that you discount that, but I'd love you to talk uh, a little uh, about that front. And I and I think the other question I have is when I look at okay, if this this international order is so powerful and all nations need to do it, if I think today um, of you know, going back to the early 1970s and, and, and China was obviously out of the system we brought in, I would say that today Iran is that country. Uh, Iran remains steadfastly out of the international system. So I'd be interested in how you look at Iran and whether you think a measure or a test of the enduring character of this liberal order as you define it will be Iran essentially choosing to integrate itself uh, into that system, whether it's, you know, on terms the U.S. would like or not, whether, whether you see it proceeding that way. Well, on China, I think China is the, the swing state, and I, th I think that wither China, wither international liberal order, uh, mm -hmm. if China is the one state that uh, is, is a potential peer competitor, it's the one state that has a, a civilizational orientation where it, it uh, can envisage itself as a kind of global leader and with a global vision. Um, uh, so China is the critical case. and. Uh, I think less, you ha there's less debate about the integrative tendencies of India and Brazil, uh, who are themselves seeking leadership and, and, and not simply um, articulating a narrow West Western vision of liberal order, to be sure. I mean, there, is, there are more nuances and uh, social democratic impulses that you see in, in, uh, in the uh, ideas of some of the rising non-Western developing countries, but China is the key. Um, I, I, there are different th things to say about China. One is simply that it, its current uh, character is that it is uh, um, benefiting from and integrating ever more deeply into the, we into the world economy. It is a member of the WTO. Its, uh, its businesses are, are, are integrated into the system. It, it, it is playing the politics of trade. Uh, and you see uh, at least the glimmering of the kind of um, 
shareholder and stakeholder mentality at the level of firms and private sector, quote unquote, uh, behavior in China that you saw in Japan uh, in the 60s and 70s. Japan you know well, uh, but a country that uh, integrated into the world economy, uh, industrialized, became Both highly wealthier. mercantilist, though. Sorry, at, at, at the beginning, uh, but as uh, have spending a year at Kadon Ran, watching the, the way in which international Japanese business increasingly saw that reciprocal behavior and, and, and joining the, the GATT at that time, uh, playing by international rules, becoming a member of, of the, the, what became the G7. So there's a real integrated story of, of Japan uh, as it uh, became, as its economic profile changed. Let me so interrupt think, you, but the, yeah. Japan's 125 million people. And, and the, the question is whether that absorption, absorptive yeah. capacity can, can work for a billion, uh, yeah, a billion it, plus. Exactly. So. Uh, we're all, it is a question. Uh, uh, so there is a question of how uh, far it can integrate and on what terms, and that's the, you know, that's the big question of the day. But I, I, again, I want to suggest that it's already in the system. It is, uh, 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 its legitimacy as a, as a regime is tied to its economic performance. It doesn't have a set of ideas or principles of order that uh, would be consider, uh, considered rival or uh, mm. competitive with the United States or with Western ideas about order. So uh, China would have to uh, emerge in a much more dramatic way uh, articulating big ideas to really think that China on its, on its own or a, as a leader of a coalition could truly um, subvert and 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 offer a, a, an appealing uh, alternative world order, mm. um, uh, and think about it this way: uh, China is not only getting rich inside the, the existing system; it's also already uh, 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 embedded in a way that allows it, it a, a measure of authority. It is a veto veto wielding member of the Security Council. It it is. Um, uh, uh, operate in, in, in most of the international institutions. Uh, so um, there is a debate and there's an open question to be sure about the future of, of, of China, but um, continuity and integration look like they are major uh, structural features of the order and that is not uh, remembered very clearly as these more dramatic portraits of a rising China are offered uh, uh, to us in, in various quarters. And Iran? Well, I, I think that Iran is, is, is sort of the, one of the hard cases that is really uh, um, outside the system and probably until it changes will remain so. Uh, uh, I think all international orders in history have, have had uh, orders is sort of rules of inclusion and exclusion and uh, and this one is no no different and uh, uh, the question with Iran is whether one could imagine a, a reformed Iran moving in a way that it could find its own ideological and strategic interests sufficiently aligned with participating under uh, agreeable terms that it could be a, a normal state in the international system and, and I think uh, I think my argument doesn't hinge on how you come to a conclusion about Iran. I think Iran could, could remain outside, largely outside the system as a kind of pariah state for, for, for several generations. Uh, but uh, again, Iran uh, may be a spoiler or a, a threat to those operating inside of this order. It doesn't offer an appealing uh, vision of, of, of what an order would look like if it had more influence. So uh, again, it's, it's, it's not a threat to the order in the way that we're talking about uh, the future of liberal, the liberal system. We're really talking about how the liberal system may or may not treat Iran, whether it treat, treats it fairly, whether it has a, 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 a clever and, uh, and uh, uh, well co a coherent strategy for, for dealing with Iran. Those are all important questions, but, but, but uh, its uh, ability to, to uh, uh, build a coalition that would uh, threaten the, f the kind of principled foundations of the existing order 
uh, just just aren't there. Hmm. Well, thank you. Um, so we can see it. Let me uh, open the floor. We, right, to Shelley. Yeah. Um, We've got a microphone. Do we have a microphone? Yeah. We usually do. Hi, I'm Shelley Williams of the Osgood Center for International Studies, and um, uh, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of, of you and your book, so I'll say that to begin with. But I'd like you to focus on on a, a comment that you made in passing about the rise of the United States. It took some time, but was sort of solidified with the Second World War, but it had occurred prior to. But during, during the time between the two Roosevelts, we were in a period of isolationism. So the next transition is going to require some political internal adjustment on the part of the United States, and it's going to require leadership. And so I'd like you to just look inwardly as opposed to outwardly for a second and talk about what it's going to take to make that shift, assuming that you're correct, which I think you are correct, especially in your analysis of China. Yeah, it is a kind of interesting s spectacle that if I'm right, the, the, the outside world is not eager for the United States to go away, and nor is it eager for the ideas that the U.S. has espoused to go away, the organizing ideas. A lot of criticism, in fact, of America over the last 10 years has been what some people call uh, uh, liberal anti-Americanism, that is to say using American ideas and standards of behavior to criticize the proponent of those standards and behavior. So uh, this is uh, interesting, and again, it leads you to think that grand alternatives and geopolitical clashes that go with the rise, that have in the past gone with the rise and fall of great powers are not what we're going to be seeing in the year, years ahead. Okay. Now, it is interesting as well that uh, it's, it may well be American internal capacities to lead that are more consequential for the future of the system. Uh, one of the epigrams for my book is a quote by Pericles uh, as recorded by Thucydides, uh, where in the funeral oration he says something like, I worry less about the strategies of my enemies as my own mistakes. And it's, it's the same spirit. And I, I don't uh, systematically explore the, the logics of American domestic politics and the nature of the current uh, 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 polarization and, and stalemate, really, in Washington. Uh, but it's, it's worth, and you're, you're asking me to reflect on that, and I think it is Im important. It, it certainly means several, at several different le levels we are going to, there are going to be adjustments going on. One adjustment is, as I do say in the book, there is going to be, um, uh, if you look back at, if you look at the sweep of history, there are going to be other powerful states in the system who are going to want to have authority. So this struggle over authority, the struggle to redistribute, it, redistribute rights and privileges and authority is for me at the heart of the drama that we're seeing, and that's what I argue in my book. But so there's, 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 there's going to be what I might call a kind of psychodrama in America about <laughs> making room for other states and, and uh, maybe remaining first among equals, but, but, but clearly working with other states around the table and, and making adjustments in in, uh, in, in voice and decision and command that have been part of this hegemonic era. So there's that adjustment inside the United States in its own self-image. Um, secondly, there are, are obviously new constraints domestically. There, there are uh, uh, disagreements and divisions and, and truly stalemates uh, that are constraining the ability of our leaders to act international, to be a leader. Uh, there are constraints associated with with, with funds, with fiscal constraints. Uh, uh, I emailed an American diplomat some months ago with an idea on something, and, and he emailed back and said, that's a great idea, John, but we don't have the money for it. Uh, so there's that kind of thing. But, and then, of course, there is what I think is a, a, into the mainstream and into Congress is a new skepticism about uh, internationalism, about institutional commitments, about providing public goods, about signing treaties, about uh, all these sorts of things associated with the American accomplishment. And it's really quite ironic where when you have Americans mostly on the right, but to some extent on the left, arguing that, that uh, these sorts of activities reduce American ability to realize its goals and to be safe and prosperous, uh, when in fact, as I think the book tries to argue, uh, 
it's precisely that type of liberal internationalism and, and liberal leadership that has put the United States in the position it is today. Uh, so the, the implication of that is that the United States <coughs> and those who think the United States has another cycle of history where it can be a global leader have to think hard about how that's going to be accomplished in this new era of constraints and, dis and, and division. And here I would say, uh, and I talk about this at the very end of the book, but it's really the, needs, a, needs much more treatment, uh, is how do we re, how do we re um, uh, build and, and reinvent a, a, public, a public philosophy for American global leadership? Think about the kinds of presidents and for, foreign secretaries we've had over the decades and the kind of language that, that has been used on the left and on the right uh, over the generations f in thinking about American national interests in a global system. I think it's, it's an it's a interesting fusion. There's an American voice. There's an authentic American voice of internationalism. It's a voice that is um, captured in various uh, personalities, but I would say including um, Truman and, and, uh, and Atchison, Truman and his, his, his Secretary of State, Atchison. Truman, a, a liberal who did believe in the United Nations, who, who was, in fact, that was his, as Vice President, he, uh, Roosevelt had put him in charge of tracking <coughs> the final steps towards the realization of the United Nations. And then you had Atchison, who was a real realist. T uh, Steve would really like uh, Atchison. You probably do. Yeah. yeah, you know, he's basically, you know, uh, had this view about the, uh, the United Nations in a speech he gave when he was in office, I believe, where he said, you know, don't expect too much of the United Nations. Uh, and he recited the old Arab proverb, you can take an ass to Mecca, but he's still an ass. <laughs> you, taking an issue to the global uh, arena, to the marble halls on the East River, is not in and of itself going to change the circumstances that have made that issue a, a source of conflict. So you have this kind of pragmatic, even kind of skeptical view in the American voice, but still internationalist, still, still in a kind of world-weary way arguing it's important to do. And then you have this slightly more idealist and we can make it happen. It, it's it's a, a, the leadership, the problem-solving um, uh, uh, um, inclination in the American personality is really quite interesting. And if you travel around the world, you notice that in South America, it's not there in the same way. And in, in Asia, the kind of, we can get together and do things and solve problems. I mean, that's, that's the other half yeah. of this thing. So this let, kind of realism me, and this kind of liberalism. Yeah. Let, me, let me just jump in here, and I want to get uh, some other questions as well. And I know, John, your thinking is tough-minded. I've been, I've been talking to you about this subject for years and, and, and going back and forth. Um, but I, I want to provoke you a little bit to say, you know, there is an element to what you're saying. It sounds a little bit Pollyannish, like we're all going to keep, keep going and keep working, and it's, you know, the, the kind of hunky-dory view, the optimistic view of the world. Uh, there's another book coming out this week by Dana Priest of the Washington Post called Top Secret America. And in that, she goes through and documents this rise uh, of essentially a, a, an intelligence uh, complex that has, been, that has grown so f far beyond the span of control of the country, uh, it's, it's become its own beast. When you think about the fact that we're just around the corner from the 10-year anniversary of 9-11, you look at Guantanamo, you seem it, it, that at least, you know, to come back to Shelley's point, that the United States to some degree is creating the competitive uh, uh, space to the own liberal order. Anatole Levin, um, you know, once called it uh, in, in his book, America Right or Wrong, that America was king of the hill of this rules-based order and then began kicking down its own hill. And so how do you deal with, I just tried to look very quickly in the book, but how do you deal with the kind of war on terror stuff that has been hatched uh, during this, this period of time? Many people would argue that it is that which has um, sped up history, what Charlie Cupshin would say, um, the, the decline of the United States, and, and move that uh, much faster. Yeah. And, and so do you, do you yeah. go into that at all in yeah. the book? I'm shocked that you would ask this question, but <laughs> absolutely a good question and, and important. And, I, I, I go into it, I do, I, I wanna, but I want to make several different arguments mm -hmm. that will, hopefully will help you. One is in the book, and that is that I do uh, code <clears throat> the American turn uh, after 9-11 as, as a turn that 
became, uh, under the auspices of the war on terror and the unipolar moment, became a source of a global instability and, and a r erosion of American authority. And I, I, I argue that, that in some ways the, that grand strategy, which, which I call a kind of illiberal unipolar strategy, mm -hmm. Uh, th that in its fullest form you might have seen and articulated by Bush in the uh, West Point commencement speech uh, uh, early in his term, uh, where the U.S. would really be above the international system in some sense, that it would be less beholden to rules and the rule of law. And so this is the international component. As you mentioned, there's a national security state domestic component. I, I, I worry about that. It is a threat to... The, the, the kind of liberal vision, and it is a darker side of the American international experience, for sure. It's not, this is not a, a book that tries to whitewash the American uh, uh, diplomatic record. It, there's, there are imper crude imperial and client state relations that show up in this book. I argue that the U.S. has acted in the most uh, uh, reciprocal, rule-based way towards other democracies. It's been less uh, of that sort in its long history with Latin America and certainly in the Middle East, it's, it's exhibited the kind of imperial behavior that you see from other states. So it's not a one-dimensional America. Uh, and I likewise realize that, that after 9-11, this, this kind of insecure America was, was brought forward and American leaders responded to it by building a, a, a much more intrusive and a, a, a national security state that you just referred to. Um, for me, looking forward, th the most likely, the best way that we can imagine a 21st century where that will not get worse but actually can get better is if we find ourselves uh, moving towards a, 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 a world order where the rule of law and the American position in it is a, a, a truly a, a, of the sort that is envisaged in America's most uh, lofty and abstract uh, uh, visionary statements about itself in the world, which is to say truly live up to the idea that it, that it is going to be a, a, a steward of a, of a rules-based open system. We all know that, that the, the, the uh, closed, uh, national security state features of the United States, as with any state, are exacerbated when there are grave geopolitical threats, when, when insecurity becomes pervasive. And so it's precisely the agenda of building an international system for the 21st century where we can rescue a measure of security through cooperation, through, as the old uh, German philosopher Immanuel Kant suggested, democracies need to work together precisely because there are threats to Republican rule, as he argued, if you truly have an unconstrained world of anarchy. So you've got to tame anarchy to protect limited, uh, limited government at home. And 9-11, took us to the edge, and I, I think that we need to move back from the edge. And you move back from the edge uh, in a concerted effort to weave an international community where, where we are less threatened by, 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 by terrorism and other, other uh, sorts of, of enemies. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, right here. Um, Scott Cooper, American National Standards Institute. Uh, I'm taken by the, by the, I guess, sort of the either or in some of, some of the things you've been saying, where it's um, the liberal tradition sort of leads to, I'd say, greater globalization, more, more uh, involvement, more, more uh, equality among all the players, and yet it still seems to be a nation state kind of order. Somebody's on top, others are on the bottom, there's a constant movement back and forth. One of the, the things that I picked up from sort of the liberal tradition, or at least one of the trends that may be growing or not, we'll see, is the fact that it isn't just the nation states, but you also have a lot of other players involved that are creating not only, you know, um, um, you know, uh, helping the economy, but also creating public goods, creating things that that, that were always sort of the, the purview of the, of the nation states, but are no longer the, that that's being the case. Uh, things like the, the Arab Spring, where it's it's um, you know it's Facebook and it's it's, um, it, it's it's all kinds of new technologies and sort of this understanding among people of a certain age group 
wherever they may be, sort of that solidarity that used to be sort of, you know, the, uh, the workers of the world or wh whatever, whatever international group you would have, I think there, there's sort of that understanding that there's this tacit agreement among uh, different, uh, different groups, even no matter where you may live. Do you see uh, opportunities, and I won't go as far as to say sort of the new medievalism, but do you see opportunities for other players, whether it's NGOs, uh, multinationals, or whatever, to play a role I in creating public goods or cre playing a role that may be outside of, of where they may stand within the nation state scheme? Yeah, and that's a great question. I, I don't buy into this idea of a new medievalism. Uh, it's a term that uh, neo medievalism, uh, John uh, uh, Ruggie and others have used that term. Uh, I, I'm not uh, taken by it. Uh, I do think that clearly. Rod Connor, right? Uh, yeah, Rod, yeah. yeah th there are several who have used the term, and it's very provocative, but I, I think it, it, it is more <coughs> of a. Uh, it more uh, it, it obstructs. <laughs> uh, it doesn't illuminate very much. It more kind of uh, uh, allows us to uh, to. It doesn't allow us to really see what the the deep structural features are. I think it, it's, uh, but it is provocative. Um, uh, the I I, I want to hold to some extent to the primacy of the state system. Uh, I I think that. Um, Certainly, looking over the last half century, the liberal agenda has been actually tied to trying to build capacities for states. And I, one of the themes of my, my book is really that the liberal project, the progressive idea that you associate with Woodrow Wilson and with FDR's Four Freedoms and with the universal Declaration on Human Rights and the United Nations itself, this whole kind of liberal movement uh, to uh, build a more cooperative system based on, on principles of human rights, um, all of that um, in some sense has been given force in the 20th century by its connection to the nation state. It has been uh, tied to uh, giving governments that are the main constituency of international order uh, capacities to, to make good on their own promises to their people. So take the, the Bretton Woods institutions. We're very much uh, international institutions. Yes, that's all true. They were, in that sense, multilateral and building global uh, order. But they were ultimately tools that were allowing governments to pursue better national economic policy. They were giving them resources to stabilize their economy when they run balance of payments deficits, for example. So think of the international order as partly a, a kind of mutual aid society for governments. And governments buy into that order partly because it, it, it gives them the, the ability to do things. And we live in, a, in an era where we expect our governments and our politicians to, to provide uh, uh, stable employment to growing economies. Uh, to protect us in all different ways. Uh, security has become a, a very expansive term, and what we mean by security is so different from the 19th century or the first half of the 20th century. So I think that a, a, a functioning international order in the 21st century will be most viable if it continues to do that. And to the extent international order is taking capacities away from governments, and Steve, this is very important. I think this isn't explored as fully a, among uh, among. Uh, the kind of debaters about international order and uh, to build capacities for governments to to uh, pursue their obligations at home. Hmm. Uh, now, um, the and and the, some to some extent the neoliberal turn, uh, which you date back to to Reagan and Thatcher, was was really in some sense enshrining the market more than gov the government. You were undercutting Keynesian tools. You were taking away capacities. Uh, and I think it's important, if the United States wants to get back at the vanguard of leading the system, it is going to have to come up to a, up with, to an answer to the question, what, ki what, is, the, what is our public philosophy, what is our vision in a post-neoliberal world? The financial crisis and other developments have clearly taken us to a punctuation point in history about the management of the world economy. The neoliberal moment is over. What is America's view about the 
markets in the state in the 21st century now. And it's in America's interest to rebrand itself and to some extent go back to the, its ideas you, that you do see in the 1940s, which were themselves uh, uh, stimulated by the New Deal, which is a, which is a more embedded liberal, more uh, managed liberal kind of vision of both domestic and international uh, economics. And that's why my long-winded answer to your question is that I still think at, at the end of the day, the international order and national governments, the articulation has to be just right. And we, we've, we've lost some of that articulation. It's not good. All of this is true, uh, but so too is the observation that uh, all of these institutions and, and governments generally are having to find new ways to pursue public-private uh, partnerships, to find new channels and conduits for NGO participation. Um, uh, the, U the UN has its Congo. Uh, there are lots of different ways in which you create mechanisms for voice, for participation. But uh, this may sound surprising for someone who is seen as a liberal uh, internationalist. Uh, I, I still think the liberal vision is anchored in building an, an environment in which national governments can provide safety and security and prosperity to their people, full stop. Hmm. Thank you, John. Uh, yes, right up here, right in the very front, and we'll go to the um, back. Greetings. Sorry, Jordan. He needs to run. Claudia Lenizio, I'm an international student at the American use your, University. Use your lungs because okay. uh, imagine you're talking to the person in the far, far back of the room. My name is Claudia Lenici. I'm an international student at the American University. Um, I kept hearing you about the international uh, world order and uh, basically the how do you think we can try to keep some countries from domination? I mean, we see that with European Union and with uh, sometimes what France is doing. So how does this uh, sort of circle way of uh, functioning things might work? How, how do we keep particular countries from dominating? Yes. I don't think it does. Yeah. Well, um, I guess what I would say is that that the problem probably in the next few decades is not uh, preventing a particular country from dominating. It, it, it's almost the opposite problem of getting countries to engage in collective action. That there is not a uh, <laughs> countries are not uh, elbowing themselves to the front of the line to be a global leader. There's there's more free riding. There's more uh, um, a reluctance uh, to to step up. Uh, I worry about that more than I worry about a particular country uh, that might follow the United States and be be a kind of uh, a global dominating presence. I've partly already indicated why I believe that uh, in regard to China, but um, just a comment on that more g general comment. Uh, the, this Ameri the arc of the American experience is, is really quite interesting because what we mean by international order really uh, became much richer and, and more coherent. You, you go back into world history and it's harder to kind of identify the characteristics of international order. What are the boundaries? What are the rules? Uh, whereas in the 20th century and particularly after World War II, international order became much more of a thing with, that you could draw pictures of, you could diagram. You, it was a, a layer cake of institutions, a complex. Uh, and, and, and so in some sense, our standard of what we mean by an international order, uh, the bar was raised, so to speak. And uh, uh, we almost, from that point, think that now we're waiting for the answer, what will the next international order look like? And we're, in that sense, expecting that it will be equally rich, dynamic, and coherent, but be led by somebody else according to other principles. I'm skeptical of that uh, at many levels, but skeptical in this sense uh, at the idea that international order will always be rich and coherent and dynamic, that, that what we may find ourselves going into is an era where the absolute amount of order is just less, and they're uh, defined in terms of agreed upon rules and principles and functional mechanisms for problem solving and so forth, that we could be see this kind of rise and decline, not of the United States so much as rise and decline of, of a functioning international order. 
And uh, that is relevant to your question about dom domination, because the, the reason we might get a, an, a, an overall erosion of international order uh, defined by anybody is, is simply that there isn't going to be a state that identifies its interests with the whole. And you have free riding, you have decentralized competition, and uh, the overall system suffers as a consequence. Thank you. Uh, very back. I've got a China question is coming. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the, the question is about China and the world order. And uh, China's uh, State Council Information Office just issued a white paper about China's pursuit of the peaceful rise or peaceful development. Uh, the idea is not new, uh, as you know. But the question is, do, do you believe in this idea after seeing what has happened in South China Sea? Uh, and second, uh, how is this China's peaceful rise available in the current world order? Right. So you. should we be satisfied with the State Council Information yes. Office's uh, promise that, that China will only rise peacefully? <laughs> <laughs> well, as a political scientist, I won't, uh, won't use a piece of paper as the guarantee. Uh, I, I'll, I'll offer a more structural, uh, perhaps materialist uh, uh, argument about uh, the rise of China and its implications. Um, I, I think the rise of China is going to be a great drama of this century, and, and China uh, will uh, have more power and influence, and the world will adjust to that in one way or another. Uh, the question of, uh, that I've been asking is in, the, in this book and the work I'm doing now is, is wh whether China will ultimately integrate and participate as a kind of stakeholder state within the existing order. And I suggest there are reasons why it would want to do that and have to do that. There are massive constraints and incentives for China to integrate and operate within, as opposed to resist and oppose and try to overturn. So I am betting, and for reasons I talk, talk about in the book, that China will ultimately be incentivized and constrained to be more of an integrator and, 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 and participant in, a, in the order rather than have the wherewithal and the ideas and the strategic interests and capacity to, to truly take us in a new direction. Mm -hmm. So that's number one. Number two, um, I am convinced it's, 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 it probably will not be peaceful. Uh, so the answer I just gave you is not necessarily that, that it will operate inside more than outside, that it will seek greater authority and, and, uh, and, and control within the order. All of that is true. I think it will be a rocky road. And I think the way I, I th think we should look at the rise of China is to try to distinguish at least three different ways that China may clash with the, the established Western world. Number one is, is what realists talk about, that a rising China will have more power and it will seek to have more control based on that power. You see this in the South China Sea. It has a growing military, growing navy, and there's going to be a clash, an old-style realist clash with the United States and other naval powers in the region. And that's something we know about. We can see it coming. We've seen it before in history. And it's a, it's a relative power struggle. And that's going to go on. Uh, secondly, a second type of clash is a, is a clash over authority. That's what my book mostly focuses on, and that's what I argue in my book is the real drama today. There is a struggle for the redistribution of rights and privileges and authority, and that's about seats at the table. It's about what tables matter. It's about going from G7 to G20. It's about, in effect, the U.S. being displaced or other countries moving in on, at the highest level of the international system uh, uh, projecting leadership and authority, sitting at the high table. The third clash is a clash over ideas. And this is what our colleague uh, 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 Charlie Kupchin thinks is, is really at stake in, this, in, the, in the great turn today. And I do not think that's the case. I don't think that China has a set of ideas about international order that are revisionist and uh, robust in any sense, that, the, that what China, the problems that, that China is going to give the old order aren't 
a run for its money in terms of ideas. It's a run for its money in terms of money and in terms of uh, traditional geopolitical power. And there, I think, uh, we, we, it will play out. But it's going to play out in complex ways. In Asia, it's going to play out where uh, China will, will find it very difficult to rise without triggering uh, insecurity among its neighbors, thereby reinforcing America's role in the region as a security provider. So the countries in the region look to China for the markets, the US for security, the dragon for economics, the, the eagle for security. And that duality is there, and it's likely to stay there for a long time. Um, and just my final point would be, I, I think the, the bargain that the US and China are going to have to look for is one where China, the US acknowledges that, that China is going to be a, a bigger player in the region and the world, and that's the authority struggle, to share authority in various venues. Uh, but at the same time, China is, I think, going to have to recognize that the United States is going to remain an, a, a Pacific power, and its allies will, will ultimately determine that one way or another. Uh, uh, the, the U.S. will remain, I think, unless its allies say otherwise, deeply embedded in the region as a security provider and partner more general, generally. But John, why, I mean, I, why, why would the United States do that? I'm, I look at, we've got Warren Coates, who's one of the great currency experts in the world, and as I understand the era of liberal uh, order building, essentially the privilege the United States got the deal was that the United States played certain unique functions around the world, and so its economy operated in a gravityless environment, whereas the rest of the economies in the around, around the rest of the world behaved differently. We provided security, uh, we were competitive with the Soviet uh, superstructure, and so those within uh, the American orbit essentially were, in my, in my view, essentially in vassal relationships to uh, the United States at that time, and, and so the United States derived great benefits from that. Today, unless you can figure out a way to run the Pentagon at a profit, it doesn't seem that the same quid pro quos exist between the United States and others in the so-called liberal order. I don't, I, I, every time I hear people say the United States will, will continue, I, mean, I, I look at the sources of American power today, meaning that are, are the size of its debt too big to fail and, and a Pentagon in a world where that kind of security doesn't generate as many security deliverables. So why do you think the United States will go on doing something that seems to be um, l less efficacious with its interests than it used to be? Because it did derive benefits in the past that were very clear. That's a great question. And, and I, I, I do say in my book that the U.S. is going to have to renegotiate bargains. And I, mm -hmm. I, I, at the end, I, I offer several different visions of the future. One is one where a, a kind of non-liberal order where there is either something very different uh, run out of China or there is an order, as I was suggesting earlier, at all. Anything can be described as order. But if there is to be a continuation of what we loosely call l liberal international order, it could be either a renegotiated American-led order, liberal order, or it could be one where it's, it's a post-American one, where, where the U.S. isn't doing the things that you've just described, security provider, public goods provider. But nonetheless, there is a follow-on coalition of, of states that, that become a more general set of supporters for an open liberal system. Now, if the U.S. is to remain at the center of this system, it will have to renegotiate those bargains. But I'm, I would argue that there still are agreements that can be re arrived at where both uh, America's junior partners and, and strategic partners of various kinds who are tied to the United States in, in security relationships gain while the United States does it as well. <clears throat> One of the arguments in this book that I, I really uh, push and I really am, am fascinated by as a political scientist is the way in which alliances have this multitasking uh, uh, aspect to them. They are alliances uh, uh, that do traditional things like provide security. Yes, they do. But they also provide political architecture for the wider system. They allow for voice opportunities from states like Japan and Korea to have ongoing strategic connections to to Washington. They give the United States leverage in the region. 
They, the, the alliance system in Asia has been part of the framework that has allowed countries like Korea and Taiwan and the Philippines and Thailand to make democratic transitions. Um, uh, so they have done, these alliances have done a lot of things. They're not just security mechanisms, they're political architecture, they're mm. voice channels and all of that. So there is, when we ta tally up costs and benefits on both sides, often we use a very narrow measuring stick or metric to, to say, is this alliance uh, a, good, a good investment or not? And mm -hmm. I think that's what you're suggesting, that, that the ledger suggests that maybe the cost is greater than the, than the benefit. And what I'm suggesting is that you may not have looked at all the benefits. Uh, and, and I think... I think the response to me, though, is yeah. that it, it shouldn't matter that the liberal order would go on and continue in the way you said, regardless of the U.S. continuing to provide that that security equation. In fact, the United States can rebalance its interests in the world, and your argument is that the deal making will take care of it, that the world will be okay. I used to call it the Microsoft, when you, you and I talked about it, I called it the Microsoft model. America get, had to get out of being sort of the big regulated utility, and if you deregulated the system, you know, it's kind of like if Microsoft was in every computer, you, 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 you had uh, essentially less hierarchical, hierarchical control but, but there were key elements of your operating system throughout the, the system. So if I were to argue with me uh, from your perspective, I would say in response that it wouldn't matter at all if the United States, in fact, forfeited that role of being the global, um, seeing itself as the global cop. Yeah, I, I, I leave that question open in the <laughs> book that, that I, I can imagine a, 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 a functioning open rule-based order where the U.S. is not playing that role. And you can provide a kind of theoretical account of why it might happen. I think it is a more problematic future than one where the U.S. continues to do things, uh, provide public good goods. And, and from an American perspective, I think there is something uh, valuable in, in having a kind of uh, uh, framework uh, where it is actively uh, generating partners and engaging in this, what we've already talked about, this kind of American penchant for problem solving. So I think we could liquidate the American system and the world will go on and there will be markets and there will be cooperation, but I, I, in speaking to, uh, to American strategists and to an American audience, I would make the case that it's in America's interest to remain uh, central to the system, to provide leadership. It's good for the United States and it's good for the system. Again, there are other models of the future, and I'm not saying that they aren't sustainable and they aren't ones that we could, we could, uh, we could survive through with. But we can debate this another time, but I gave time. you a Hobbesian view in which your liberal order still survived. Uh, which was rare, I think, actually. <laughs> uh, yeah, Michael, and we'll go right here and then end with this gentleman over here. And we'll give Mike you some Hager. time to meet uh, uh, John. My name is Mike Hager, and uh, I, I've appreciated your remarks, and I, I think most of the discussion that I've heard has focused on other nation states as potential challenges to a future liberal world order. But I wonder about resource constraints as the world gets more and more crowded going forward in this century food, water, energy. Uh, do you see those challenges as an opportunity or more as a real threat? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for that question. Uh, um, more book sales. No. <laughs> Sorry. Behave yourself. Um, <laughs> the, um, the argument, in some sense, the, the, the argument that, is, that threads through this book uh, and which I think is at the heart of liberal inter the, the liberal internationalist uh, uh, vision is that the the the, pr the problems of interdependence are what necessitate uh, a liberal international order. That is to say, there the the, the the countries face an international environment where they have a they are really it's really impossible to be safe and secure alone. What is changing the world and what is creating the continuing constituency for uh, liberal internationalism, I argue, is this rising economic but also security interdependence. And this is my way of answering your question. 
security independence is a situation where uh, a country can be safe and secure regardless of the capacities and intentions of enemies, whether they be other states or whether they be terrorists or anybody else. Uh, that's security independence. Security interdependence is when you are in an environment, a country where what others do matter and you have to actively do things to prevent them from hurting you. So uh, in the case of secure, the security interdependence really became a dramatic reality during the, the Cold War with, with nuclear weapons, the, the nuclear revolution, where the U.S actively had to convince the Kremlin that it would be suicidal for them to attack us. If they did attack, we couldn't stop it. We didn't have missile defense or the oceans were not wide enough. So that was really very clear security interdependence. What many of us see when we look into the 21st century is, is a world where that's getting even more complicated and, and uh, in a diffuse, uncertain, and shifting way. That the threats are not just nuclear weapons uh, uh, wielded by the Kremlin, it's now all sorts of different threats from all sorts of different places. Not just other states, as I suggested, but sure, surely terrorist groups, proliferation, uh, WMD, uh, uh, global warming, health pandemics. So these are not just uh, traditional types of enemies, be, be they state or non-state actors, but uh, the revenge of nature, in effect, the environment. <clears throat> to, to remain safe and secure in the 21st century under conditions of rising security interdependence, you are uh, obligated, really, to find ways to work with other states to reduce those insecurities. So if I were to boil it down to a bumper sticker, we can't be secure alone, we can only be secure together. And that is an agenda of, of cooperation, of, of security cooperation on all sorts of different things. And uh, my colleague Anne-Marie Slaughter and I worked hard on this question when we uh, were uh, uh, building the, uh, and working on the, the, the Princeton Project on National Security. And this is the heart of our vision of a kind of multiplicity of transnational threats and, of course, traditional threats. And the implication is that you have to uh, build capacities internationally to <clears throat> save yourself from these things. More people and more places matter. How people burn energy, how they treat their minorities, how they do or do not provide for public health for their people, how they uh, ratify or do not ratify international treaties and agreements, all of these sorts of things with more and more people in more and more places matter. So that is an agenda that, that is in front of us in the 21st century. And I don't know how you would ever develop um, a response to that, that in increasingly com complicated and worrisome international environment without building on what I've described in this book as a, as a liberal accomplishment or American mm -hmm. accomplishment. It's, this, it's the same platform that has to be uh, expanded, re-legitimized, made more functional for new problems. And that's at the heart of the, the internationalist agenda. And it speaks to your, your question about what are the nature of the threats. Okay, I'm going to take these last cluster of questions because we're getting near the end here. Let's, let's go to this gentleman in the back. We're just going to work our way up the, the side here. Yes, if you'll, we'll try and make them brief and then we'll get John to, John gives these kind of great mosaic uh, right. answers. So Thank we'll, you. Yeah. Okay, uh, go ahead. Um, I just have a question uh, to uh, regional organizations such as the European Union. You based very much on uh, the Euro European, uh, on the American perspective, and I would just like to know uh, when you talked about the key uh, feature of integration, um, especially uh, uh, an example like the European Union or the GCC, um, I would like to know what do you personally believe in the future? Um, it goes in the same direction like the last question if we have these energy uh, and, and financial issues uh, like in Europe where people are realizing we have to work together maybe a European army maybe a financial okay. stronger economic government yeah. so I would just like to know what you personally believe in this direction these regional organizations okay. what is their importance for the future thank you uh, and then right here in the middle Ellen Baugh Montgomery College would you discuss the U.S. role um, in the Arab-Israeli crisis, and uh, should the U.S. rebrand its policy? Uh, where do you see that going? Okay, interesting. Peter? 
I'd like to build on some of your, both your comments to an intersection of international and U.S. domestic politics. You gave the implication that we're sort of over the top, we're on our way down, and it's just sort of accepted. And my question is, I don't see the domestic U.S. political system being able to adjust to that situation. In other words, I don't see a presidential candidate, doesn't matter which party, saying to the country, we're number two, we got to do A, B, and C if we're going to recover. It's always going to be morning in America, we're great, everything is hunky-dory. I can't see a leader saying, we've lost the top. So Does it talk about that intersection. And, and then we'll go right here to this gentleman, and then we'll wrap up. Hello, my name is Jonathan Kachuk from the Osgood Center for International Studies. Um, sir, you mentioned, um, or you implied that one of the characteristic features of this liberal world order is its resiliency. And um, you mentioned before it's easy to get in and it's very difficult to get out. And that uh, I believe you also mentioned that it's uh, difficult. It's, it's easy to join and hard to overturn. Exactly. Yeah. Well, that's what I meant. And I guess my, my question is, um, is this world order is it is it as resilient as you as you imply? Because I, I can uh, think of um, experiences in the past in, in history where there was a more or less a liberal um, foundation for international relations, and it was inherently fragile. That if a state is big enough and powerful enough and willing enough, and China comes to mind, that that order can be. Um, doesn't even have to be overturned. It could be modified. Um, so uh, yeah. that's these my are great question. questions, John? and I'll try to be European clear. Union, Arab-Israeli crisis, look. domestic U.S. political system, and and is the international order fragile? Yeah. On this last, I'll just go in reverse order. I, I I I'm making an argument in the book that it's it's robust and not fragile, even though I know that you, you can see those characteristics in past orders, and uh, I it's precisely. I, 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 I mean, I'm making the argument, and, and I'm suggesting why that that is the case, and and uh, uh, it's there's a long set of arguments about it, but um, uh, it has to do with the, uh, the, the, the 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 multiple characteristics and reinforcing components of the system, uh, and its functionality and legitimacy, and this is kind of a question that I think I can answer all of them in some sense. Uh, by making this one point and then saying a few other things, but, and that is that I, I think international orders rise and fall based on three characteristics. One is power. Is there power behind the order? Are there either the United States or, or a coalition of states that see it in their interest to support that order? You need power, and that's since I'm a realist. Secondly, legitimacy. Does the order have principles that resonate with the, the polity views, the polity principles of the states that are in it? And thirdly, functionality. Does it solve problems? And when I look at China, I see p the potential of, of rising power. But I don't see principles, as I said earlier, that suggest that China has, the, uh, has within it a, a set of ideas that could be floated out there and seen as legitimate that are wi wildly different from what we have today. And thirdly, functionality. If China wants to run the world, it's going to have to propose an international order that is functional in the sense of solving problems. And that goes back to my earlier quite emphatic answer to a question about why orders need to provide tools and resources for states to make good on their obligations. Mm -hmm. so, so in that sense, I think there's, the alternatives are not there. And the functionality and legitimacy of the existing order is so great that it's hard for me, even a China on a good day, uh, finding itself able to truly engage in a kind of world-wrenching uh, transformation. And that, that, that's, that's my bet. That's my argument. But it is very much worth open to debate. Domestic politics. Uh, um, is that right? I worry about that. Uh, and I'm not, I don't have anything special to say, but I think that that's, that's where a lot of the, the, uh, the Trouble uh, ahead will will emanate from the, the 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 problems of 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 the of American leaders being able to stand up and make commitments and reassure other countries. I think <clears throat> the debt crisis negotiation 
uh, is still being talked about around the world. What, is, this, is this the United States that we remember? And, and what does this mean uh, if the U.S. is the linchpin of the system? If the U.S. is providing system functions for the world, and yet that, that linchpin country looks like it's kind of wobbly, and it, it, it may not be able to generate commitments and, and do what it's done in the past, that for me is, is, is the, the big question. And, <clears throat> um, and then the other point was really about this, what I called a psychodrama of the U.S. having to kind of adjust its self-image. And there I think we can do that because it, I still think as far as we can look into the future, the United States will be, uh, I think will be the, the preeminent country in terms of global leadership for 20, 30, 40, for most of the years ahead of us. It can play that role. It may be a, a different role than the old role, but it is still as a kind of leader, as a country that is unique in its capacities. So I don't think leaders have to stand up and say, it's all over for us. Uh, and not only that, leaders are going to be able to say, if we want to uh, run, if we want to be a world leader uh, going forward, we're going to have to do great things again. So there is well, Obama's speech. Been saying that. <coughs> there is speech, there's speech material here. Uh, there is an agenda for, uh, sort of, there's an agenda lurking for renewal that might be built around clean energy and, and uh, it, social investments. Uh, so I think it's, it, it's, it can happen again. We've, that's happened in the past, it can happen again, but it's tough. My Absolutely. quick answer, because I want to jump in on this, yeah. on this one, is that it doesn't matter that if you have an American leader uh, who, who can't be square with the American public about what's happened. It won't matter because that decline, relative or absolute, is very evident in education scores and economic data and, uh, and, and, and the sort of broad view around the world that America can't achieve the things it says it's going to do. Um, Libya is looking like a little bit of a standout to that all of a sudden, but I don't think we have that connected to any strategy to make whatever momentum from that. And the last lesson that you would take from that is that, you know, like Anne Marie Slaughter, um, uh, John's colleague has written this provocative piece called The New Age of Intervention. I don't think we're anywhere near that, and that, that in fact would be an incredibly reckless uh, lesson to be taken from what was largely a tilting point, tipping point strategy uh, that the president and, and others sort of largely had, hashed with Libya, but it was saying, you know, the outcome isn't going to be owned by us in that, in that particular case, and we were going to be moving away. It's, it's, it's kind of an intervention light uh, strategy, if you will, because of, in fact, I think it's the right strategy uh, perhaps to have taken, but it was taken because of, you know, NATO stretch marks and, and, and the, the perception of wild um, over uh, stretch by, by U the U.S. military on so many fronts. So anyway, sorry to interrupt, but yeah. yeah. <coughs> Suppose uh, we had, this is the Middle East question. Right. Israel, Palestine got miraculously got an agreement. They come to us and say, we each need $3 billion a year to make this work. I could see the American Congress saying, wait a minute, that problem, I've got something else to pay for this, and the whole thing falls apart. Maybe, but no, it's, we're, it's we're pretty cheap. Yeah. yeah, that's pretty that. cheap. We're, it's a pretty that, cheap. I'd love to we got that away point. with that, that'd be pretty <laughs> cheap. <laughs> Uh, uh, that's right. I mean, what we probably do in that case would launder Saudi money or something. Uh, you know, um, he said that not me, but I, yeah. I, I, I think we can. Yeah, I think we'd find money if you could, if, if in that range for a, for Middle East peace. I, I think we would probably try to find the money, uh, although the Japanese may not uh, give it to us this time. But is there a reinvention opportunity in the Arab-Israeli crisis? I'll just truth in advertising. I this book is n does not will not help you understand the Middle East. It's not really about that part of the world, uh, it's, it's, so I, I, the book will not, to not be able to, to, to help out so much, but, um, you know, I, I, I think that uh, uh, this is an area where, where I think the Obama administration has done some very good things uh, uh, in Asia, and I think uh, I, I like what it did with Russia. Um, I, and I think they're doing great things in terms of reimagining uh, you know, the, the social networking, development, uh, diplomacy network, uh, and ne nexus, I think those are the areas of strength that this administration has had. I think the Middle East has been a disappointment. I think raising expectations and finding itself tied to uh, two leaders that were, for di different reasons in, in Israel and, and Palestine, unable to, I, I to think, move forward. I think you're missing another great opportunity to show how your system works. 
um, in this because my answer on the Arab-Israeli uh, crisis is that you could approach this in, in redefining this new era in which America was behaving differently, not dominant, but there in the mix, by essentially nudging things forward and then letting the French run forward. In other words, what I see the really interesting lesson which the Obama doctrine may, may turn out to be, and they, they don't know it yet, uh, is that the Libya decision was sort of the G20ification of international security issues. That, that you had America give a nudge, then backed out. The French were furious with us, but lo and behold, you know, NATO got um, a little bit of a gold star uh, in, in some of what it did. I think the Arab-Israeli issues now the, the increasing uh, current of wisdom there is the U.S. has got to get out of the role of being, uh, s perceiving itself as the dominant player when in fact it's a fairly corrupt role in which it, it, it guarantees one side, not the other. But, you know, in this process, you can actually give Turkey, give Russia, give uh, uh, various European states much more lead, which they're demanding now anyway in this, and it changes the quid pro quo arrangements in there. That could be an interesting part of renegotiating rights, which could be much more efficacious right. in no, this. I think, that, I think that's And that fits your... Good. Yeah. No, I think that is an issue that's... I'll go around more, with you and answer questions. Much more creative uh, response than I can provide. I think, no, I think that is... Uh, I think we're, otherwise we're really at an impasse. And, uh, and, and then finally, before we close, because I want to give people an opportunity, I think we've, we found a few books in town uh, t to sell. I hope, I hope we have them, but uh, if those of you would like to have them. Otherwise, for those watching online, I also got a text message. Um, somebody said I hadn't introduced myself. By the way, I'm Steve Clemens uh, of the New America Foundation and Washington editor of The Atlantic. But I want to give people an opportunity to talk to John uh, personally as well. But on this last question about European Union and regional, and I want to tag one element on there. The, the Europe grows essentially by dangling carrots or has grown by dangling carrots and says, you know, it's sort of like the Borg in Star Trek. You know, it's an assimilation strategy where if another state becomes, decides to regulate itself in the Aki Communitar and they decide to, you know, accept and apply these 80,000 separate regulations and contort themselves around to, to look like Europeans, then ostensibly they can, you know, connect. It's a very interesting, to me, that sounds a lot more like a rules-based negotiation order than the United States essentially spreading democracy at the point of a gun. And it so... A, and I certainly don't... Yeah. I'm not advocating spreading democracy at the point of a gun. No, I know, I but it's... That's really yeah. at the heart of yeah. the, the American system. I think uh, it's, 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 it's a feature that's appeared uh, at various times, but that's not what the American system is about. Um, I think in some ways, and this is my response, uh, Europe, and the, uh, Europe as a region and the United States as a global as a kind of center of a global system are, 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 are facing similar problems. In some ways, uh, as, as Steve said, Europe is built upon uh, providing attractions for states to integrate and work within a reciprocal rule-based system that sh where sovereignty is shared in various dimensions. And it is reaching an impasse that will either lead it to pull back from, in this case, single uh, currency monetary union or move forward and and to build uh, new capacities in the fiscal area for management of this complex system uh, similarly the US system has uh, encountered uh, new problems that we've talked about today problems that are problems of interdependence but they're but like Europe they're problems of success not failure Europe is in its is in the, the state it is now because it has integrated states and has offered a kind of promise of union that states have uh, been attracted to. And, and those are problems of, of success, uh, of, 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 of a project that has gone part way, but to, to fully solve those problems, it has to go further, not go in a different direction. And in some ways, that's the American challenge. It's the challenges that the United States has integrating rising non-Western developing states integrating uh, other states uh, around the world, uh, solving and addressing these transnational problems, which are problems of interdependence, economic and security interdependence. Those are precisely the same thing. They are problems of success. If the, pro if the American vision had not been realized much more dramatically and successfully than even 
Truman and Atchison would have thought in their wildest dreams, we wouldn't be dealing with these problems. These are problems of success. They are problems of a, of a larger global system that has, in effect, been brought into uh, this uh, post-World War II constructed system. The, the inside order that was part of the Cold War, the American system, became the outside order. The inside order became the outside order. States from all over the world were brought in. We've got the WTO. We've got uh, rising states that are transitioning uh, in a market direction. And those are problems, but they're probably, we should say, they're problems of success. They aren't problems like uh, Woodrow Wilson confronted after 1919, which was really a different kind of problem, problems of failure, of, of the inability of the liberal project to get up and running. Our problems are because the liberal project got up and ran. And uh, they are leading to new problems that, that they are problems that, that, uh, of liberal internationalism that can only be solved with more liberal internationalism. So, you know, the king is dead, long live the king. There is a, a, there's a set of challenges, but they're ones that we should be glad we have. Uh, because looking back into history, there are other problems that, that are much more violent and dangerous and uh, 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 and ones that we would certainly like to avoid. So I, I, I somebody said it, it, when he read this book, uh, well, John, you've written a very brave book, which I think he meant foolish. <laughs> <laughs> and in some ways it is basically uh, uh, optimistic about the capacity for humans to develop social institutions to solve problems. But if you look back at the long history of, 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 of this, of the human project, not just the liberal project, it's, it's not outside of our grasp. And we've done it. And it's, it's been done in the context of upheaval and violence and war and revolution. Uh, so it's not a, I'm not making a prediction that we will have a peaceful, uh, 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 you know, peace, love, and, uh, and eternal uh, stability, but, but rather that the kinds of problems are ones we should want to have and that we are not devoid of theory or history or practice to tackle those problems. Well, I want to thank John Eikenberry for spending his afternoon with us. I agree with Michael Cox uh, who's of the LSE and his line, this is nobody has thought longer or deeper about the nature of American liberal world order than John Eikenberry. Spig Brzezinski uh, said, John Eikenberry, America's leading scholar of international affairs, brilliantly relates theory to historical change in his timely advocacy of a new U.S. foreign policy. Big doesn't offer praise like that often. Uh, I know him well. Um, you know, I'm in, in my own view, because I, I approach this, as John knows, from a, a realist portal, a progressive realist portal. I very much want John to be right. I fear that, that uh, and I keep kicking the tires of, of, of uh, his liberal Leviathan thinking. We've been having this conversation for years. I'm so pleased that the book is out. I highly recommend it uh, uh, to those online and, and those here. Um, liberal Le Leviathan, The Origins, Crisis, and Transformation of the American World Order. You know, every once in a while there is a book uh, that everyone has to have and, and to read and, and to keep. Um, there are fewer and fewer of those. There are a lot more books, but um, they, they find their way out uh, of my uh, uh, bookshelf much more quickly. But, but this is one that I think is very important because uh, John Eikenberry is making us all, I, I think, much more deeply about the international system, which I find in my, own, in my own view, and when I get my book out there, you can come provide it, is I look at this at, as, a, as a very interesting moment of historical discontinuity. Uh, where a lot of this is being rethought, and I, and I hope your, your vision uh, plays out. So uh, please join me in extending a hand, uh, a round of applause for John Eikenberg. Thank you very much.